Now that we know the difference between term insurance, which is like renting a policy, to cash value life insurance, which is owning a policy, let's get into the simplification of the different types of cash value life insurance. Instead, I'll be focusing on the type with the greatest historical significance regarding guarantees. Now, before I break down the fundamental differences between the variations of cash value life insurance, when considering your plan A, always look at pros and cons of any financial tool to make the best educated decision based on your tolerance and needs. And being that you've already developed an emergency fund, you know what it takes to, to begin your financial journey. Now, I like to break down the different variations of cash value life insurance based on risk. We have high risk financial tools and we have low risk financial tools. You know, everything in life that we do has some degree of risk. I mean, anytime you go sprinting across the street and dodging traffic, you're taking on a certain degree of risk. Or maybe you want to try skiing down a mountain for the first time. Are you going to go all out? Or are you going to get on the bunny slope and do that whole pizza pie thing? Or maybe you want to try something hot and strange and spicy for the first time on a first date with someone you like, or the bathrooms might be questionable. <laughs> The point I'm trying to make is that we can look at financial risk in the same light. For example, if you choose to put all of your money into the market, you're taking on a certain degree of risk for the hopes of gaining interest or dividends on your principal investment. Of course, there are different ways to help mitigate risk from the types of investments that are made to the funding strategies that are used, how you go about trading, your timeline, and the goals and standards you set to achieve the purpose of investing in the first place. Overall, the risk of putting your money in the market is at the high end of this risk continuum. You take all the market risk, you normally pay some form of fees or expenses with each purchase or trade, or via assets under management, and then you have to pay taxes on any gains in relation to the type of account that's set up. Now, I'm not trying to dissuade you from investing. I think, you know, on the contrary, I think you know, having a strong portfolio with the goal of long-term investing can give some incredible gains. But if you're ready to begin retirement during one of the downturn years of the market, say this past year, for example, the year 2022, and the markets are down by double digits, where a traditional 60-40 bond and stock portfolio are experiencing the worst years on record. I mean, if this was your year to retire and all of your eggs were in one basket, your entire retirement strategy is essentially at risk. I mean, you might have to end up working until the day you die. This is why considering cash value life insurance is so important because even during the downturn years in the market, the general accounts of life insurers are still accruing interest because insurance companies are very conservative with their general accounts. Let me remind you that during the Great Depression, when people were standing in line at the banks just trying to get their own money out and being turned away, or they were standing in line at the soup lines just to get some food, and they were coming from all walks of life, it wasn't the banks that bailed out the economy. It was the insurance companies. Anyway, sorry for the tangent. If we were to look at a continuum of risk of financial tools, we can all agree that putting your, all of your money in the market is essentially at the high end of this risk continuum. And if you don't know what you're doing or don't have someone representing you who does, it can be just like gambling in a casino. Not a very prudent way to plan for your financial future. Now, if we were to go to the very opposite of this, now sit side of this continuum of risk, let's look at one of the least risky financial tools, something that's been tried and true for some 200 years. And unlike the stock market, it has guarantees. The money is liquid and your principal sum of money is protected. What am I talking about? That's right, whole life insurance. One of the least risky of the financial tools. Although if it's not designed properly, it can also be one of the most expensive. So make sure you're working with an independent agent who works with several different companies, not pushing any one particular product, and knows how to design a policy properly in the best interest of their clients. A quick side note, did you know that we wouldn't be able to enjoy uh, Disney World to this day if Mr. Walt Disney didn't own his own fully funded whole life insurance policy? That's right. When he needed the banks to help him with loans in the later years of the park's development, the banks simply didn't share his vision. So they ignored him. And that's when old Walt decided to use his own cash values from his whole life insurance policy to finalize Disney World's end development. Now, if you've ever heard of the phrase banking on yourself or something along those lines, I can't think of a better example. Of course, most of us don't have Walt Disney's money, but that doesn't mean that his strategy can't be scaled down to fit your income level and needs. I mean, it's simply a tried and true strategy with long-term historical evidence backing that it works. 
Now, when it comes to risk with regards to cash value life insurance, or in this case, whole life insurance, there are two real risks that you always have to be aware of. And if they're designed properly, the risk is minimized even further. Assuming you're healthy enough to acquire a policy or have a direct family member who is healthy enough to obtain a policy on them, what are these risks? Well, the first and most important risk is kind of a no-brainer, but it's to make sure that the minimum base payment of insurance is being made in relation to the death benefit in order to keep a policy in force. Because after all, this is a defensive contract meant to keep your family whole in the event of your passing. And just like with car insurance, what happens if you don't make your payments? Well, there's generally a grace period, but what happens after that? That's right, you lose your coverage. So don't expect a life insurance company to work any differently. Now this is true of both term insurance and permanent cash value life insurance. If the minimum premium isn't met, the policy could lapse, and there's nothing worse than putting your hard-earned money into a vehicle only to find that you couldn't afford what you agreed to commit to in the first place when you partnered with a multi-billion dollar life insurance company. So, Understanding what you and the insurer are contractually obligated to and bound to is of the utmost importance when finalizing your policy. In short, always understand what you can afford outside of your normal cost of living so that your policy can come bound and grow effectively. That you can continue to go out to eat and go out to the movies and to do the things that you like while your policy is building. On the plus side of this, if you were to miss a payment, all life insurance companies offer a 30 day to 31 day minimum grace period to help get you back on track. If it's a whole life policy, you can actually use all that built up compounding growth that's built inside the policy to help pay for this expense. Now I'll touch on this a bit more, now. but with regards to payment risk and your worst case scenario, you can always cash out your policy along with some surrender fees, but essentially take all that built in cash value that's accrued interest over the years. Now, to help mitigate payment risk, many life insurers offer a, a 10 year pay, a 15 year pay, paid up until 65, or a traditional pay as you go your entire whole life strategy. The choice is yours. And when it's designed properly, you can pay a policy up even quicker than that and get a jump start on your compounding growth. And if you choose for additional fees, the insurance companies also offer various riders that you can attach to your policy to help mitigate certain risks that might concern you so that your policy can compound and grow throughout your life. And you'll have access to all those tax-free benefits that your life insurance policy offers. So go ahead and go swimming at your leisure. Now the second risk that you should understand and the insurance companies have built into their policies to avoid from happening, is not allowing your policy to become what is known as a modified endowment contract or a MEC for short. Now to explain this, I always like to think of comparing your policy to say a swimming pool where the pool is the policy itself and the water coming out of the hose into the pool is your money. Now, you don't wanna leave your water spigot on overnight while you're filling up your pool, because if you do, you're essentially gonna overflow your pool. And every day that you forget to turn off the spigot, your water bill is going up and you're flooding the neighboring environment. Think of this excess overflow as taxable money now. So essentially, if your goal is to use the guaranteed compounding cash values, income tax-free while you're living, there are laws in place that basically state that in order for a life insurance policy to remain a life insurance policy, you just can't put too much money into it too quickly, otherwise it overflows and morphs into a, a taxable vehicle, similar to how a traditional IRA would work along with all of its taxable rules and regulations. But don't let this scare you. The MEC amount is stipulated in the design upon agreement your annual reports, and it's written inside your policy. You're gonna know exactly how much money you need to put inside of your policy at any given moment. And keep in mind that if your policy were ever to be on its way of becoming a mech, your insurance company will notify you prior to it happening so that you can make all the proper adjustments, essentially informing you not to put any more money into your policy for a period of time. And even after that, if you chose to disregard the warnings and your policy became a mech, you would still have the safety of principal, a guaranteed death benefit, and liquidity on your cash values. So Sensei, get on with it. How does a whole life policy actually function? Well, the answer to this question can become very convoluted if you allow it, but I'd rather keep things as simple as possible. Understanding the fundamental concepts inside of a working policy will help you decide if a whole life policy is the proper plan A for you.
I'm going to be using a visual depiction to help you understand how a whole life policy works. And the reason I've done it this way is to help describe how some folks have overcome certain concerns and obstacles. Since you know how a term policy works, imagine if you were to purchase a 10-year, million-dollar level premium term policy from the ages of 20 to 30. Now remember, term policies are like renting the coverage. If you outlive the policy, the coverage is over and a new policy must be created in order to continue the protection. But during this time frame, the insurance company is on the hook for $1 million income tax-free dollars that's paid out to your beneficiaries and contingent ben beneficiaries upon your death. So, how do these insurance companies come up with the premium? Well, let's not get it twisted. Life insurance companies are in the business of financial support between two direct variables, life and death. Now, some of the life insurance companies have been in business for over 200 years, and they know what they're doing. They hire actuaries whose sole purpose it is is to understand the probabilities of death in relation to age and numerous other factors. Therefore, the cost of insuring someone between the ages of 20 to 30 is very, very low. Why? Because they know that someone around the ages of 20 in that age bracket is insignificant compared to someone, say, in their 80s or 90s, where that probability is much, much higher. Therefore, someone in their 20s has a higher probability of passing away of an accident or some high-risk activity as opposed to someone in their 80s or 90s. Well, you know, let's face it, of natural causes. So this in itself is just another factor actuaries use when coming up with the cost of insurance. Oh, and did I mention Life insurers also actually use reinsurers to back all the things that they're doing. That means that the insurance company that you link up with doesn't fold like a house of cards due to irregular claims. I mean, for example, if you were to die of a car accident the very same day that you closed on your life insurance policy, the insurance company would be obligated to pay out that full million dollar death claim to your beneficiaries. Now that's a big loss for any business. The client pays one premium into the policy, passes away, and the company has to pay out a full death benefit. I mean, in this situation, this is where a reinsurer that your insurance company is partnered with would cover some of that additional cost to your life insurance company, keeping them solvent. So, the financial protection runs deep, very deep, with the oversight of regulators, which is a good thing. Unlike putting your money with the Madoffs of the world, or who's this latest guy, this Crypto King guy, the guy who just lost billions of investors' dollars? And I'm not talking about millions of dollars, I'm talking about billions of dollars. I bet those investors wish that crypto had some form of regulating body like the NAIC and the SEC. A little accountability, please. Anyway, sorry for the additional tangent. All right, so back to how a whole life policy functions. So if we can continue this trend of buying a 10 year term policy every 10 years because you didn't die and you still needed to give the protection to your family, so you re-up and you get a new policy, if we were to continue that trend, the cost of insuring someone between the ages of 20 to 30 is very, very low as we have already seen, but the, the cost of insuring someone for another 10 year term policy at the age of 30, that's gonna be a little bit higher just as the cost of insuring a 10-year policy for a 40-year-old is going to be higher than that of a 30-year-old. Just as a 50-year-old, a 60-year-old, and a 70-year-old is going to be higher in cost. Why? Because we know that as we're aging, we're getting closer to death. Now, assuming that you could actually purchase a 10-year term policy at the age of 80, 90, 100, 110, 120, or heck, even the most healthiest of centennials will tell you, they're not going to live past 120. So why am I describing whole life insurance using a series of 10-year term policies? Well, collectively, you would have purchased 11 10-year term policies to cover you over your lifespan. This essentially represents the true cost of insurance. Now, let's just say that you could acquire a term policy at the age of 110, the cost of insurance would be so high, the insurance premium would be just as expensive as the death benefit. I mean, if you personally had a million dollars in your back pocket and a 110 year old person said, hey, if I die over the next 10 years, will you give that million dollars to my loved ones? I mean, how much would you charge that 110 year old for that, for that contract? Yeah, you probably wouldn't even make the contract, right? So the reality is, is that as we age, 
Most of us, we develop diseases and conditions, essentially making us less healthy. By being less healthy, these conditions increase the likelihood towards death. From an actuary's perspective, these are simply more factors to consider when deciding whether or not a policy should be underwritten. Most insurers will not insure someone between the ages of 75 to about 85. And again, that's dependent on the carrier. No matter how much money you throw at them, because these actuaries have actually determined that this age bracket and beyond is too much of a liability for the insurance company. So, as a term policy renter, the conundrum is that once you get to a certain age, you can no longer acquire a new policy. This is known as the term trap, because with every new term policy that's written, a complete physical workup and evaluation must be completed. I mean, what's the likelihood that you're going to develop, say, type 2 insulin-dependent uh, diabetes, a cancer, or a heart attack, or stroke. Now, to assume that you're going to be healthy enough to acquire another 10-year term policy is a risk all unto itself, and you shouldn't be considering that very lightly. A good place to start is when devising your strategy is to take a look at your family's health history and maybe asking yourself, historically, when do things kind of break down for most of my family members? But you still need the protection. So how do life insurers lock in your insurability so that you never have to undergo underwriting ever again and can have the protection your entire life? Well, rather than purchasing a term policy every 10 years, the life insurance companies actually offer you the ability to own your policy. Once you lock in your health rate with a whole life policy, you never have to undergo underwriting ever again. This goes for all forms of cash value life insurance. Now, by doing so, you essentially pay more upfront for the earlier, healthier years of life beyond the cost of insurance. Why? Because this allows the company to build up a reserve for your later, generally more unhealthy years of life and to be able to stretch out the policy to age 120. Now, if you think about it, this is kind of like building up equity in a mortgage when you buy a home. Because when you buy a home versus renting a home, you always pay more towards a mortgage than you do for rent because you don't own anything when you rent. Similarly, the additional funding that goes beyond the cost of insurance in a whole life insurance policy is now deemed as additional cash value. This, is a, this additional funding is then tied to a multi-billion dollar insurance company's general account. All the interest growth inside of a whole life policy has both guaranteed and non-guaranteed values. And it's in writing. Once you've paid beyond the cost of insurance, this is your cash value. This is your money that's built up inside your policy that you own. The interest growth inside of your policy is generally going to grow uh -huh. around between 45 to 6% annually, compounded, guaranteed. But this also depends on the carrier that you're working with. But it'll be in writing. And the cool thing is, it's now a part of your, your cash values. It's locked in. You'll never lose any of your principal funds beyond the cost of insurance. Now, another great aspect about your cash values is that your cash values are liquid. You can borrow from these funds anytime you need to. All you have to do is contact the insurer and ask for the funds the intelligent way, a way that doesn't create a taxable event. Now, what I mean by that is borrowing through a loan from your insurance company while essentially using your cash values as collateral the loan rate is going to be somewhere around 5%. <laughs> well, hold up a second. Why wouldn't I just use the cash values built up inside the policy directly? Why can't I just use that? Now, that's a reasonable question. Just know by taking out a loan from your company, your cash values will continue to grow and compound inside of your policy as if you never touched it. The interest growth after the loan will be dependent on the form of recognition that your life insurer offers. But that's pretty good, right? I mean, you borrow from the company, but your policy continues to grow without a hitch. Now, let me pivot regarding this topic of discussion. If you're ever sitting down with an agent who tells you that when you take out a loan from your whole life policy or cash value policy, and, that, and if they tell you that it's coming directly out of your death benefit, you should probably politely get up and walk away or kindly walk them to the front door because this is false and they're doing a great disservice to you by misrepresenting how cash values functions inside of your policy. So you can choose to pay back your loan or not. Keep in mind that there always has to be enough cash values in your policy for the policy to remain solvent. 
In other words, you can't ever take out a loan from your, the carrier that's greater than the amount of, of built up cash values in your policy. But if you did pass away after taking the loan and chose to never pay it back, your beneficiary's income tax-free debt benefit will be reduced by the amount owed from the loan. In this way, the funds will remain income tax-free and creditor protected. Now, remember what I was saying about being intelligent with your policy. This includes how it's funded, and not to bog you down with legalities, but it's important to know that over the past few decades, there's been some legislation known as TEFRA, DEFRA, and TAMRA. You see, back in the day, people were putting crazy amounts of money into their cash value policies. More money than it actually related to a death benefit. Because of the guaranteed compounding growth, the income tax-free benefits, the liquidity, and the safety of your principal, they figured out, for example, that they could take this same million-dollar whole life policy and dump, say, $10 million into it and watch it compound guaranteed at 45 to 6% every year. Now, there were no laws stopping these people from doing this, and you can't blame them for being savvy, but those days are gone. So essentially, the way these laws have been enacted, you generally can't overfund a policy to the point that it's no longer considered a life insurance policy. You simply have thresholds. But the way a whole life policy functions to this day remains the same. So what happens if you overfund a policy? Well, if at any time you were to put more money into the policy than it relates to a death benefit, the Tamra, DEFRA, and Te uh, TEFRA legislation has stipulated that your life insurance policy has now morphed into what is now known as a modified endowment contract, or MEC. This goes back to what I was saying before about overfilling your swimming pool with too much money. Simply put, the contract as a whole has now morphed into essentially a taxable vehicle. With the same IRS rules and regulations applied to it as a traditional IRA or other qualified plan. So to avoid a policy from becoming a MEC, the insurance companies have devised many strategies to calculate the accidental overfunding. You might have heard of tests such as the seven pay test, the cash value accumulation test, guideline premium test, or corridor test. These are calculations that the insurance companies continually perform throughout the life of your policy to create your MEC limit, which will be included in the illustrations, your annual reports, and your actual policy. So don't let this scare you. You'll be informed of how much money you can put into your policy and enjoy its compounding tax-free benefits within a few years of purchase and throughout the life of the policy. This is fundamentally how a whole life policy functions in relation to a, a given death benefit where you pay more upfront in your earlier, healthier years to build up your cash values inside of your policy to offset the high cost of insurance in generally your later or unhealthier years of life. So the question then becomes, what are your goals? Do you simply want a level premium, a guaranteed death benefit for life that's creditor protected and transformative with estate planning, allowing you to pass on a legacy to your beneficiaries and contingent beneficiaries? Or, do you want to purchase a whole life policy for its living benefits, the cash values, the guaranteed interest growth, that's income tax free, and its liquidity and principal sum is compounding every year? Instead of focusing on the debt benefit, your focus can now shift to the living benefits of a whole life policy by stuffing as much money inside of a policy as you're federally allowed in the earlier healthier years of life in relation to a contractual death benefit and watch it compound. Now, the great thing about owning your own policy is that you get to have a say in where some of those funds are going regarding the cost of insurance. By having access to various riders, or in this case, a paid up addition rider, you can actually lower the base cost of your insurance and increase the amount of cash values that are actually building up inside of your policy. By flipping on this type of rider, it will in effect change the death benefit. But who cares? With this example, your focus is on the living benefits of a whole life policy. At this point, we're getting into aspects concerning design. And as I mentioned before, a poorly designed policy for the focus of living benefits can make it one of the most expensive forms of life insurance. Again, this is why it's important that you work with an independent agent representing numerous different carriers, not pushing any one product from any one company, and is willing to take a pay cut to ensure a properly designed policy for their clients. I myself am an independent agent representing uh, in the states of New York, Virginia, and Florida. The act of acquiring a policy is a very important step in your financial path, and everyone is different. 
Some people make up their minds quickly after gathering all the, the pertinent information, and some people need to ponder more. Either way, it's an important decision that will follow you the rest of your life. And you want to make sure that you can handle the payment risk and understand the MEC risk and whether or not a whole life policy is the right type of policy for you based on your objectives. And if you're still on the fence regarding starting your own policy, maybe your job offers you something, keep in mind that nine times out of 10, most work-related life insurance is not portable, meaning that if you leave your job, you lose your coverage. So it's better to start your own policy while you're healthy and uh, gain a little bit more control over your life. In this sense, this is why I have access to my Court and Apply software. Simply plug in some basic information to see if you're insurable, input the amount of death benefit uh, that you want to be able to leave to your beneficiaries, choose the type of life insurance you're inquiring about, whether it's term insurance or cash value. In this current example, we're talking about whole life insurance. But you can also inquire about universal life and index universal life, which I'll be doing an additional video on. And voila, it will automatically populate different quotes between multiple different carriers, giving you the best rates. Not only will you be able to populate different quotes, but you can also download an actual illustration from that particular carrier. These are the same exact illustrations that agents use to sell you life insurance when they sit down with you one-on-one. -on -one. If you like what you created, you can, you can apply right then and there and schedule your blood test to find out what health rating you fall under. The medical professional will come out to a place and time of your choosing to draw the blood and perform any other tests that the insurance company might want. And don't worry, the cost of these tests are bundled in your first year's premium. And if you find out that you're too unhealthy from the testing, the insurance company will absorb this cost. The price of doing business, so to speak. So I always recommend having a physical exam prior to your testing date so that you can represent your healthiest you. And just know that type 2 diabetes, cancer, heart attack, stroke, these are generally uninsurable conditions. All in all, by having access to this platform, you can make this important financial decision based on your time and whether or not you want to move forward. Now, if you try to create an illustration on my Quote and Apply platform but was unable to produce the results that you wanted, simply email me. Let's get to know each other by, by uh, creating a little bit of a dialogue, and that way I can know what your goals and objectives are. I'll help craft a design for you. And just know that there might be some additional carriers I represent that might not populate on my platform in general. Lastly, keep in mind that with the war in Ukraine, there is a huge uptick in life insurance fraud. And with the sanctions on various Russian oligarchs, I'm sure they might be looking for ways to launder money into a policy. This has nothing to do with Russian American citizens, most of which are against funding opportunities for Putin and his war on a sovereign nation like Ukraine. Just know that I'll be checking the list of Russian elites featured in the ICIJ investigations. So if you're a Russian oligarch, please don't even bother trying to apply. And as for the rest of my Americans living in New York, Virginia, and Florida, Please consider me as your agent. I want to help as many people protect their families and accrue interest in their policies as possible. I hope this video regarding whole life insurance has been informative and given you some insight toward whatever plan A you're deciding. Please look to the description of this video to gather my Quote and Apply platform link and be on the lookout for my next video where I'll be discussing universal life insurance and indexing. And no matter what you decide, keep climbing your own mountain. No one can do it for you. Hopefully you'll eventually make it to your peak. Thanks again, and take care.